fifth case is a case that occurred back in 2003, and I'm happy to say it's been partially overturned. The case is McConnell versus Federal Election Commission, and it's about free speech, specifically campaign finance speech. Campaign finance reformers had this quixotic idea that money and politics should not mix, and so they passed the McCain-Feinvold uh, campaign reform law in 2002. Well, six years later, we had the presidential election, and we see how well that law worked. There was more money spent in the 2008 presidential election than in any election in the history of the universe. The Cain Fine Gold ultimately got codified as big BCRA, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. And the Supreme Court, I think inexplicably, upheld Bigger, in this case, McConnell versus the Federal Election Commission. The court decided in that case that political expression, the very most important speech that's protected by the First Amendment, political expression will get less protection under the First Amendment than Klan speech, than gangster rap, than pornography, than flag burning. All of those are protected, and in my view ought to be, under the First Amendment, but not all types of political expression, and in particular, in particular, McCain fine gold death that if a corporation, let's say Random House, a uh, well known publishing company, were to publish a book, 600 pages, and somewhere in that book it had three words vote for Obama or vote against Obama, that book would violate the law and it could be banned from publication. Now, we're not supposed to be about banning books in this country. And that's why the Supreme Court took a second look at this issue of campaign finance reform in a case that was decided just not too many months ago called Citizens United versus FEC. And happily, January of 2010, the court overturned McCain Feingold's two worst provisions regarding corporate and union speech. The first of which was the one I just mentioned. You may not say vote for or vote against the candidate anywhere in a publication that's funded by a corporation or a And secondly, you may not even mention the name of a candidate. You don't have to say vote for, you don't have to say vote against, you don't even have to say anything about the election. You may not mention the name of a candidate for a federal office within 60 days of a general election or 30 days of a primary in any broadcast adversity. Citizens United, the FEC, overturned those two rules. It was about Hillary, the movie. It was a movie critical of Hillary Clinton. And under mccain goal, this was the rule. You could show Hillary in the movies. You could even sell Hillary in the movie on DVD. But you could not advertise that the DVD was available, and you could not advertise that the movie was shown. Moreover, you could not make the movie available on-demand cable, because that was considered to be a broadcast. At first, now this is absolute nonsense under the First Amendment. And thankfully, Justice Kennedy, writing for a very narrowly decided court, five to four, correctly recognized that corporations and unions are not this monolithic block of money that always fall on one side of an issue. Typically, corporations support one side, unions will take the opposite side. Even within the corporate community, you often have a case where they oppose one. Walmart, for example, was a vigorous proponent of Obamacare, proponent. Whole Foods was very much against uh, Obamacare. Now, bear in mind that under the new rules, and this is not something you would have gotten from the media, under the new rules, even after this latest case, Citizens United versus FEC, it is illegal for any corporation or any labor union to contribute money directly to a candidate. It is illegal, not a dime. What is legal now is for these corporations and labor unions to pay for advertisements out of their own property, their own assets, as long as those advertisements are not coordinated uh, with the campaign. That's the change that was made uh, by Citizens United. Now, is there a problem with big money? Well, if so, the proper answer to large expenditures for speech is either more speech or ultimately if we decide that the system doesn't work, that it breeds corruption, then a constitutional amendment. The one thing we cannot do is treat the Constitution as if it's made of so much tissue paper, that the First Amendment is merely 
a loophole. And that effectively is what the court did in the earlier case, McConnell versus FTC. And as for money, it's really a symptom of the problem. The real problem, the underlying problem, is that overweening government has wormed its way into virtually every aspect of our daily lives. We have this pervasive regulatory and redistributive state dispensing largesse in Washington, D.C. So no matter, no wonder, we have people running to D.C. seeking their share, their, their part of the public trough, creating huge incentives for profiteering. So if there's a big money problem, it's because there's a big government problem. And if we were to cut government down to size, we could minimize the influence of big money and restore the framers' known ocean of an enumerated, delegated, and limited uh, federal government. Here, 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 here. Now let me, let me finish with one case that you may have heard of. Uh, it's a relatively recent case, and it's about eminent domain up in New London, Connecticut. The case is called Kilo versus City of New London. So imagine that you have a cherished home that you've lived in for some period of time, and you'd like to stay there. And a private developer comes to the City of New London and says, let me have that lady's home and all the homes surrounding her. And the city says, for what purpose? And the developer says, because I know how to use her home her property better than she does. I'm going to, <clears throat> with my contacts with Pfizer, <clears throat> get them to build a pharmaceutical plant. And there's going to be a hotel, and there's going to be an office building, and that's going to increase the number of jobs and the tax base. And that's all to the good. Well, they asked Mrs. Kilo about this, and she didn't like the idea. She said, well, what about the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution? Number five in the Bill of Rights, where it says, <clears throat> private property can't be taken except for public use. Now, when I think of public use, said Mrs. Kilo, I can understand roads. I can understand military bases. Maybe even a government office building. But I can't understand turning my home over to a private developer because he has ties with Pfizer Corporation. Because he can build an office building or a hotel. And when the Supreme Court looked at the Kilo case, litigated, by the way, by the Institute of Justice, the court said, yes, we understand that the Fifth Amendment says public use, but that's not really the way we're going to read it. We're going to read it as if it means public benefit, public purpose. And clearly, when you increase the tax base, when you increase the number of jobs, that serves a public benefit. Of course, if that's the criteria, nobody's home is safe from the government bullshit. Fortunately, there is an epilogue thanks to a media campaign by the Institute for Justice, there was an outcry post-Kilo decision, probably greater than any outcry since the Roe v. Wade decision. And as a result of that outcry, 43 states have now changed under state law their definitions of eminent domain, and they have reined in the extent to which eminent domain can be used by private developers for economic uh, development. And that, I think, <clears throat> gives us two lessons. One of which is, there's more than one way to win a lawsuit. Even if you lose in court, as the Institute for Justice did, you can win in a second court, the court of public opinion. By mounting a media crusade, the Institute for Justice succeeded in getting 43 states to change their mind. And the second lesson is, the states can always give us even more protection for our rights than the federal government does. The federal constitution sets a floor and not a ceiling. And here's a case where the state constitutions have exceeded the rights protection given to us, and even more protection than did the federal constitution. One other interesting fact about Kilo, and that is, even though Suzette Kilo's home and her neighbor's home have been relocated, the Pfizer plant never happened. The hotel never happened. The commercial office building never happened. And if you go up to New London, Connecticut, you will find in that area where the Kilo home was a vacant lot. And it has been vacant for years and years and years. Well, in a free society, uh, we should not have to ask for government permission to participate in an election. 
We shouldn't be forced to buy health insurance or bail out car companies. We shouldn't be able to have to give our private property over to other private developers for economic development. But those abuses of government power can only be minimized if the Constitution is implemented, if the court in particular binds the legislative and executive branches with the chains of the Constitution. And regrettably, the Supreme Court has occasionally been derelict in fulfilling that function. And it is time to restore constitutional government. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah.